So uh, we will be going live within uh, within a minute, sir. Yeah. I will give that information. So then we can start. Yeah. You please call me later. I'm busy on a lecture online. Mm -hmm. Prashanji, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, good evening all. I'm Prashant Dupade, working as a woman sales manager for Alchem Prisma, well known. On behalf of Welcome uh, Alchem Laboratories, we, have, we welcome you all for Alchem Masterclass Neurology Scientific Series. The aim of a masterclass is to, is to revisit and understand the complex area, knowledge, technique in the field of neurology uh, through our eminent speaker, uh, panel of speakers. Alchem uh, has always been at forefront when it comes to a scientific uh, dissemination of the knowledge in the neurology fraternity. Neurology masterclass is again the step uh, further in the same direction. We also recognize the best question or the topic <laughs> from the participant. Uh, the winner will be announced by our speaker at the end of the program. The show winner will be presented on behalf of Alchem. For today's masterclass, we have Dr. J. Nathan, our eminent speaker of the day. Dr. J. Nathan, who will be deliberating on ma the masterclass, Topic is the management of the refractory epilepsy. To begin with, I will take uh, I, I will like to take a privilege to introduce Dr. J. Nathan. No, he is a consultant uh, neurophysician at uh, Shushusha Hospital and honorable uh, professor for pediatric uh, department neurology, uh, D. Y. Patil College and Hospital Pune. He has a fellowship, uh, fellowship at Sin City Hosp uh, Children's Hospital in the year 1984. Visiting professor for J uh, John Hopkins Hospital Epilepsy Department 1996. Pioneer of use of the ketogenic diet for uncontrolled epilepsy in India and Asia, 1996. Dr. Jainathan has appointed as a uh, for for International League Again Epilepsy for the Dietary Therapy Task Force year 2013 and 18. And again, he uh, he has been uh, re reappointed as a member of the International uh, League Against Epilepsy Dietary Therapy Task Force year, year 2021 to 2025. Uh, Director Therapist Task Force and the Medical Therapist Commission. Uh, appointed as a member of Executive Committee uh, in the International, Nole uh, International Neurology Ketogenic Society uh, in the year 2020 to 2025. Dr. Jane Hathen has uh, organized the world first two webinars and uh, several workshops for the ketogenic diet in India and Asia and published for several papers in a peers reviewed international and Indian journals on ketogenic diet. This is all about Dr. J. Nathan. Sir, over to you, sir. So thank you very much. And thank you for that introduction. Welcome, and thank you all of you who are attending. So what is refractory epilepsy? First, we must know what is epilepsy. And I do not want to go over that. You all know what is epilepsy as mentioned and as uh, defined by the ILAE. Uh, two unprovoked seizures, one of uh, unprovoked and the probability of further seizures, diagnosis of an epilepsy syndrome, but it is resolved if you have an age-dependent epilepsy syndrome or you remain seizure-free for 10 years. The diagnosis of epilepsy is basically on a good history, a good video, and then a good examination, and lastly, a good activated EEG, not just a routine EEG. So you first see a patient that could be epilepsy or may not, not likely to be epilepsy, and then the first seizure, you may be sure that it is going to turn into an epilepsy and become an, an epilepsy syndrome, or you may have to wait for a second and then begin the anti-seizure medication. And I continuously, I'm going to emphasize what we are giving nowadays is an anti-seizure medication, not an anti-epileptic medication. I'll explain to you what is the big difference between the two. 
So it's very simple, the seizure types, they can either be focal or generalized. Focal could be with awareness or impaired awareness. And all of you have seen this in the ILE. It could be motor onset, non-motor onset, the generalized again, motor or non-motor, and it could be unknown. But look at this. So this is the natural history of epilepsy. 40% of all patients with epilepsy will be fully controlled on the very first anti-epileptic, no anti-seizure medication. I purposely put anti-epileptic because, because that's what all of you call it, anti-epileptic. It's not anti-seizure medication. If the first doesn't work and then you have to use a second, another 20% will be fully controlled on the second anti-seizure medication. That's 60%. If you use a third and a fourth, you get another eight to 10%. Following that, the last 25 to 30% are uncontrolled or refractive. And in the, any number of medications you try, you will not get more than one to 1.6% 1 of full your control. So this is the history of anti-seizure therapy development. The older anti-seizure medications were controlling about 65% of the patients. And with the new anti-seizure medication, the second generation, and now the, yeah, yeah uh, the third generation, <laughs> we've added maybe another 10%. So around 75% will have full control. So what is drug-resistant epilepsy? Failure of adequate trials, important adequate trials, two tolerated, important to to tolerated, appropriately chosen, again, appropriately chosen is important to achieve seizure freedom. Unfortunately, it did not allow for auras and it requires 12 months of seizure freedom or three times the seizure-free interval, whichever is longer. It's also known as pharmacoresistant epilepsy, intractable epilepsy or refractive epilepsy. So most of the mechanisms of the anti-seizure medications have focused on the neurons, the sodium channel blockers, the potassium channel openers, GABA and glutamate being the chemicals. So they either they enhance inhibition, these are the anti-seizure medications which enhance inhibition, or they reduce excitation, and that is the list. <clears throat> if you look at this, you will see that it acts on the sodium channel, the potassium channels. Uh, can you see the entire uh, yeah, slide? Is it visible? The GABA and the, the glutamate receptors. And this only the new one is the synaptic vesicle protein 2A, SV2A. So the anti-seizure medications are neither are uh, curative nor are they yeah, preventive. They're purely seizure suppressors. So they're not anti-epileptic in that they have no effect on epileptogenesis. They are not prophylactic. They are unable to prevent an occurrence of seizures after an insult. What is the recurrence rate after withdrawal of anti-seizure medications? In non-idiopathic generalized epilepsy, it's 25 to 30%. And in idiopathic epilepsy, in the idiopathic generalized epilepsies, it can go up to 90 to 100%. So the anti-seizure medication, what do they do? They stop seizures, yes. Do they halt epileptogenesis? No. They, do they prevent recurrence? No. Do they repair the damage to the brain which has occurred, which is the cause of epilepsy? No. Can they stimulate neurogenesis or new cell formation? No. Can they reduce the triggers of the acquired epilepsy? No. Can they reduce the genetic and epigenetic causes of epilepsy? No. So you will realize that there's a lot yet to be done in this epilepsy. So I call it as the iceberg. The development of anti-seizure medications is, has been targeting only the tip of the iceberg. Namely, the targets are the G-protein coupled receptor, the ion channel sodium potassium, the protein kinases. But the cause is right down in your triangle. The primordial metabolites, adenosine and ATP, RNA peptides and protein, 
bioenergetics and the metabolism which is abnormal dna and the epigenetics and there only what we call is the metabolic i have therapies can work so remember epilepsy is a metabolic i have problem and it will have to be dealt with um, as a metabolic no like, therapy so what are the metabolic like, therapies the ketogenic diet which is either in the classical the mct ketogenic diet the modified atkins diet the low glycemic index therapy and two medications which have come in two dg which acts on on uh, yeah, the glucose and cef triaxon cef triaxon has not yet been used adequately in humans so what is the ketogenic diet all about it is probably the diet of the 21st century it has changed the way we look at diet up to now all uh, the world believe that a high fat diet is bad for health in fact it's not it's good for health so hippocrates actually his work uh it laid the foundation later on 2300 years later for the ketogenic diet and he talked about epilepsy not a curse not a prophecy it is a natural cause and very important he mentioned that purging and fasting can give a cure both of them are important purging and fasting and you will realize why purging is also important the same thing is mentioned in the bible where you, this boy whom you can see in the painting down below is taken to jesus and they say that he is getting seizures because jesus says okay leave him with me for a week and when they come back he's cured and when everyone says this is a miracle he says no this went by fast fasting that's what's written right down fasting so this is our normal diet much of it is carbohydrate less is protein least is fat carbohydrate as you know is used for energy production through glucose and atp and carbohydrate gives is converted in the liver to glucose while fat is not converted to glucose it is converted into ketones so when you limit the carbohydrate supply you lower the glucose levels therefore you lower the insulin levels and when insulin levels are low lipolysis occurs means fat is now mobilized taken to the liver and that is converted into ketones so the ketogenic diet turns the yeah the pyramid on its head and fat becomes the maximum and carbohydrates the least so what so one of the reasons why you get seizures is that this balance between the excitatory and the inhibitory glutamate and gaba is changed either gaba becomes less or glutamate more ketone is the only therapy which can decrease the glutamate and increase the gap it has an action on both so let's just show you two patients so this patient young boy had ya doze syndrome with head drops repeated injuries you can't see it well but he had 10 fits every day and if you can look at very carefully his head on both the sides had the bumps so what was his mom's reaction all hell broke loose it was not controlled with many medications we thought we had lost lost ram forever he lost his speech he lost his eye contact he lost his recognition luckily they came to us very early we put him on the ketogenic diet and within 3 weeks the seizures was seizure free he got back everything he is now in the eighth standard so that is a super responder all are not so lucky this girl had 75 to 100 generalized tonic clonic seizures a day afterwards she is off uh, no fits and off the diet you can see she's eating yeah, samosas and puffs but it took us time I- i'm sorry it took us time it took us 3 years to control all the fits and another 3 years for the eeg to mm, normalize and then we could take her off within a year and after s- Seven years, she was ultimately off the diet, back on her normal diet, and going to school. So, what are the ketones? Ketones are substances which are produced from fat. 
either ingested fat or stored fat. So keto, the genesis is the production of fat or the breakdown of the uh, production of the ketones controlled by insulin and glucagon and occurs in the liver. While keto lysis is the breakdown of that same ketones for energy production. So let's see what happens to these fatty acids. I'm, I'm using the terms. Uh, uh, I may use one term once and another term another time. So when the glucose drops and insulin drops, free fatty acids in the blood increase. There's an increased lipolysis in starvation or when the carbohydrates are very low. So glucagon stimulates the ketogenesis, the meaning the formation of ketones from the fat, while insulin inhibits it. So whenever your insulin drops, you're going to have mobilization of lipids and they are converted into fat. This can only be done in the liver because it has an enzyme known as HMG-CoA. It cannot be done extrahepatically because they do not have the HMG-CoA synthase enzyme. So what are the ketones? Acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate. And the last is acetone, which is, which, which is excreted in your breath. So acetoacetate and beta-hydroxybutyrate are the ones which are ketones which are going to have action. That then goes into the brain and muscle and it is used. It is used to be converted into 2-acetyl-CoA and then gets into the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle. And therefore, it gives you energy. So every cell gets energy. However, thiophorase or SCOT, we call it, I call it SCOT, succinyl-CoA transferase, is not available in the liver. So the liver is unable to use this. So therefore, all the ketones which are formed in the liver get into the blood and are used by the brain and the muscle. The brain and the muscle use the ketones electively. That means if they were, if they were given ketones, they would use it. The infant who is fed by the mother's milk gets its ketones from the MCT oil, which is in the mother's milk. <clears throat> and that ketosis is the reason why children or babies who are fed by the mother's milk have much better intelligence and uh, the development of the brain because they are in ketosis. Even if they are uh, fed for only six to eight months, those ketones remain and they can be used till the age of two or three. So there are various types of uh, ketogenic diets, as I told you. So our diet is 60% carbohydrate, 15% protein, and 25% is fat. In the ketogenic diet, yeah, the classical one, look at the difference. 82% becomes fat, 11% is carbohydrate, and 7% is protein. So therefore, in about 15 years ago in the Johns Hopkins, they tried a modified Atkins diet. So Atkins was the person who used the diet for weight loss, which was a low carb, high protein diet. So they modified that and kept the carbohydrate at 62%, uh, sorry, at 13% and the fat at just 62%. So they dropped the fat from 82 to 62 and there was an increase in the protein and in the Carbohydrate. Then came along the mass, uh, yeah, the mass general hospital, the Massachusetts General Hospital, and they tried a low glycemic index treatment and found that it also works. So, what is a low GI? Low GI foods means as compared to your glucose, you compare the uh, glucose level in the blood with 100 grams of glucose as compared to 100 grams of, say, rice or wheat or um, vegetables or fruit. And those where it rises to less than 50% of the rise in the blood glucose with 100 grams of sugar or glucose, you say that that is a low GI. So what happens in low GI is when you eat that, your glucose levels fall. 
when your glucose levels fall, your insulin falls. And when insulin drops, you start mobilizing fat. But they don't have much of uh, ketones in their blood. Then came along another diet known as the MCT ketogenic diet. I talked to you about the MCT oil. So what's the difference between MCT oil and the oils that we use? All the oils and the ghee and the butter that we use are long chain fatty acids. MCT is a medium chain. It's not available easily. So we have uh, a purified MCT oil, which luckily is tasteless and odorless. <clears throat> and can be given along with food. The advantage, it does not go through the lymphatics and get deposited in the fat stores. It goes directly from intestine to liver and can be converted into ketones. So you see the advantage of using MCT. With MCT, what happens is that you can give less of fat it's it's fifty percent, and you can give more of carbohydrate. And MCT uh, then becomes a larger amount. It is no taste, no odor. It can be mixed with any of the foods. And the long chain fatty acids are only yeah twenty percent. But but the blood ketones which is negligible in the normal diet, is moderately high, high in the classical and MCT ketogenic diet, mildly high in the modified Atkins diet, and hardly, just minimally high in the, uh, the low glycemic index. So what are the targets for epilepsy? Yeah, yeah, control. Now, ion channel dysfunction, there can be brain pathology, molecular disruption of cell signaling, like the mTOR pathways, neuroinflammation, stress, hormonal changes, transmitter expression, immaturity of the homeostatic mechanisms, altered metabolism, namely the metabolic epilepsies, and mitochondrial dysfunction in the mitochondrial epilepsies, and the gut microbiota. So how are the metabolic therapies different from the anti-seizure medications? The basis for disease modifying and anti epileptogenic effects of the metabolic therapies is restoration of the impaired bioenergetics and mitochondrial function, improved redox regulation, that means basically antioxidant, the NAD NADH uh, ratio, Reg regulation of both excitatory, excitatory being reduced, inhibitory being increased, neurotransmission, yeah, glycolytic restriction. The signaling you know, your, your pathways, such as the mTOR pathway is affected. It has anti-inflammatory action <clears throat> and it has epigenetic effects on the DNA and the histones of the HDACs. So these are the metabolic therapies and they have uh, effects on all of these, inflammation, epigenetics, on the gliosis, on the calcium homeostasis, on antioxidants of ROS, on increasing the ATP and the apoptosis. So what happens in epilepsy? You have an external or internal injury, which causes inflammation. Then you have the kindling, and then it, it affects the cells, astrocytes, glion neurons. It affects the ion channels. It affects the transmitters. It affects the effector cells like the leukocytes, the glion neurons, and the blood brain barrier also. So that also can be affected by inflammation. And ultimately, you get epilepsy through the kindling. So that takes time. So you can have an initiating effect with the repair. Initiating effect with failure to repair, you can have onset of epileptogenesis, or there is no consequence. Or right away, you can get seizures. Now, anti-epileptogenesis means disease modification. And this takes a long time. There's a latent period between your insult and the epilepsy. So anti-seizure medications are simply symptomatic suppression of the seizures. Okay? So chronic epilepsy, the last yellow uh, box, chronic epilepsy is often pharmacoresistant. The other unifying mechanism 
this is a hypothesis is yet is that there is glucose hypometabolism due to inflammation and that triggers network hyperactivity with an oxidative stress so there's an imbalance between oxidants and antioxidants or the redox balance is affected and there is oxidative stress which also results from seizures so it becomes a vicious cycle so glucose hypometabolism could be one of the uh, the trigger factors which could be caused by the inflammation so these are the pet scans delineating the epileptic focus so you can see in a there's an inflammation area which is red and when you inject glucose you can see that the glucose hypometabolism is there and that same area is blue so there is glucose hypometabolism in areas which are the epileptic focus so the same thing is seen in the pet and the spec and you can see glucose hypometabolism so this has been seen and that abnormal glucose metabolism how it works we still don't know but it is probably the increase the glutamate the excitatory neurotransmitter and give rise to an or abnormal mitochondrial function so what do ketones do when you don't have glucose you can always use your ketones that's how you manage to fast for 30 days 40 days 50 days because after the third day of fasting you are no longer using glucose you are mobilizing your fat and using ketones let's go to how it works so this is the prize winning question the person who answers it first on the chat will get the prize in which condition or conditions is the ketogenic diet the only option i'm giving you two minutes in which condition or conditions is the ketogenic diet the only option actually there are two but even if you answer one of them it's fine <clears throat> okay have you got any replies in the chat have you received any on the chat no no sir not yet not yet okay so we'll give them some more don't tell me no one is going to take away the prize come on this is ketogenic diet is the only option in two two conditions i think someone has replied Hair fall. Hair fall. No, 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 no. I'm talking about yeah seizures, neurological, neurological condition. I should have mentioned which neurological condition is ketogenic diet the only option. I'll give you a hint. Seen in infants and babies, very young children. No one has yet. Uh, the refractory epilepsy is the answer. Sir. Someone is giving. No. No, no, no. no one. I'm because I'm not going to show the answer. The answer. Anyone heard of this? The GLUT1 yeah, yeah, deficiency. So if you have a GLUT1 deficiency, glucose can't get into that brain because you need a glucose. and your transporter that is glut glucose transporter and you have these little kids infants who come with infantile spasms they have multiple types of seizures they can also have mental retardations and they can have um movement disorders yeah choreoathetosis etc they can present with all three of them or one of them so glucose is not getting into the brain and it won't go in if you you have a glut one deficiency but the thing what what can get into the brain and feed the brain are ketones because ketones don't depend on glut one they depend on monocarboxylic a transporter which is in everyone you will never find a person who doesn't have mct and mct here is not mct oil right? it's it's a monocarboxylic the transporter so these are the features of the glut1 deficiency syndrome you get a glut1 encephalopathy 
with intractable infantile seizures and complex motor uh, disorders. You can get epilepsy and movement disorders. You can get only epilepsy or you can get only movement mm -hmm, disorders. The only epilepsy, epilepsy can be of different types, idiopathic generalized epilepsy, focal epilepsy, refractory epilepsy, and the doses syndrome, MAE, what used to be called the myoclonic aesthetic. It's now called uh, the doses syndrome. And you have the PDH uh, your deficiency, the pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency. That also, the ketogenic diet is the only one. So I have a number of these patients and they are probably the super responders. You just begin them and boom, they're gone. Everything is gone. So how does it act? Now here is how it acts. And it's such a complicated thing, right? Beta hydroxybutyric acid. It has an effect on IL-1 beta, interleukin-1 beta which is known to increase seizures and excite it. So it reduces that. It reduces the cytokines. It reduces aspartate. It increases GABA. Let's go down green. It is an antioxidant. It reduces neurodegeneration. It reduces neurodysfunction. Let's go on the opposite side, right on top. MCT, yeah, the decanoic acid, that is the C10. So by, by the way, um, MCT is C8 and C10 oils. Okay. So they are C8 and C10. And C10 is the decanoic acid, direct ampi inhibition. So which drug has ampi inhibition? You all of you must be knowing that. You will answer it immediately. Yeah, perampin. It reduces the HDAC. So therefore it has effect on uh, the epi uh, yeah, genetics, the NRF2. Therefore those are spontaneous seizures. And right down, it works on the excitation and the kindling, which is very bad for um, people who are going to get seizures, after injuries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it has an action on them. So let's see what all it has. It has action on the sodium channel, on the potassium channel, on the excitatory. It has action on glutamate, aspartate, and AMPA, on the inhibition GABA B receptor. Blood. Look at this. Other targets. On the glucose hypermetabolism, it works as an alternative fuel. It increases mitochondrial biogenesis. It blocks FFAR3. It's anti-inflammatory and antioxidant. It has effect on the gut microbiome. It has effect on anaplerosis. I'll, I don't have time to go through each one in detail. I'm so sorry. It has effect on the epi are your genetic modifications, which can cause yeah, the epilepsies, as we know, and it increases the brain-derived neurotrophic factors. So therefore, it's very good in people who have neurodegeneration. It also has in, uh, effect on the left side of epilepsy, NLRP, inflammasome. So that's the inflammation part. PPAR, alpha, PPAR, gamma, it reduces that, and on MPT. So it's got so many actions. So let's go right down to the third, I'm sorry, to the second last line in blue blocks. Decreases neuronal excitability, improves synaptic integrity, increases the bioenergetics, reduces the reactive oxygen species, and go above that to the green chain, um, as the blocks. It has action on the adenosine A1 receptors, on the ion channels, on the TCA cycle, on anaplerosis. It has antioxidant action, mitochondrial function, and histone acetylation. As you know, that's very important for aging. So it increases neuro protection. <clears throat> so this is a summary of the ketone mechanisms. Neurotransmission. Metabolism regulation, neuroprotection, genomic effect in mitochondrial regulation. Under metabolism, metabolism regulation, why have I put altered gut microbiota? This is why. The gut-brain axis. So it is known that the gut has an effect on the brain. It's also known that the gut microbiota, if they're abnormal, and this is known, that if there is 
dysbiosis. It's associated with neuropsychiatric disorders, including epilepsy. And the ketogenic diets alter that microbiota, causing epigenetic changes, metabolic reprogramming, and therefore the pathology and the pathogenesis of epilepsy, neurodegenerative diseases, and even the cancers. So right now, we've started using the ketogenic diet in cancers and in Alzheimer's and other neurodegenerations, including uh, the PSP, which you know, you know, you know that none of these, you can even halt, little leave alone reverse. Well, I've shown that you can halt and reverse patients with Alzheimer's, with PSP. There's a patient who's come with DLBD, and we're able to do that. Ketogenic diet then becomes a part of the whole thing. So don't think that this is all about it. So ketones have a very good effect on the gut microbiome. So in summary, anti-seizure medications can control seizures but have no effect on epileptogenesis. No effect. 25 to 30% of all epilepsies are refractory to anti-seizure medications. Metabolic therapies can control even refractory epilepsy and reduce or halt epileptogenesis in epilepsy. They're very safe. They're much safer than the anti-seizure medication. They're much less ex uh, expensive. Uh, but you need people who are trained. And you need to know that the gut microbiota have a great influence on epilepsy. So I think with this, I will halt because then uh, the rest of it is very detailed about each of the mechanisms of epilepsy. I thank you. I thank uh, Alcan for having uh, brought me to you. I hope some of you will be enthused now to look at the metabolic therapies in your patients with uncontrolled epilepsies. And many of you believe that it can be used only in infants and in the children. Luckily, I have done my neurology way back in the 1970s and 1980s. I finished neurology in 79. I mean, I, sorry, I didn't finish. That's the time when I passed. So uh, <clears throat> at that time, we did both adult neurology and ch child neurology. So I have been using the ketogenic diet for refractory epilepsy, refractory epilepsy in adults and adolescents since 1996. That's ever since I began using this diet. We have trained almost all of the Indian centers. I would say not almost all, every Indian center using this, including Ames and Velour and uh, yeah, CMC Velour and PGI, uh, yeah, Chandigarh, and you know, all, all, all of them have been trained, including Outside of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Singapore, and recently Vietnam. So this is a very good um, yeah, therapy. It requires a lot of input. And uh, that is how uh, this happens. Okay, someone is asked, so how does the gut bacteria affect epileptogenesis? Very, very good question. Your gut bacteria are, you know how many? Yeah, trillions. Your cells in your, uh, in your body, you have about 2.5 to, I think, uh, your 3 trillion cells, and this is about 4 to 5. If they are abnormal, and most of us in India have this, because we eat out, even if you eat in good restaurants, you know what is the hygiene level of the people who uh, make your food and who serve your food. The hygiene levels are very, very poor. So you develop what is known as a leaky gut. So I hope all of you, even though you're neurologists, know what is leaky gut. I hope you also know that Parkinson's is believed to begin from the gut. And in fact, I believe this is yet uh, something which is your personal. They, they have to work on this. I believe that most of the of, of the degenerations of the brain, especially and including the others, begin in the gut. So when you have a mild infection, the epithelial cells, which are next to each other, stuck, they open out, and you get a leaky gut. 
so the, 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 the so the bacteria get into the blood and they cause inflammation uh, if you have long term inflammation your chronic inflammation it's known to be one of the important one of the very important causes of epilepsy degeneration of the brain including parkinsons and even the cancers so so it has a very great effect uh, the next question asked i just saw it up is there a head to head comparison of anti epileptic medication with the ketogenic diet unfortunately no reason is that we use the ketogenic diet in refractory epilepsy so they've already gone gone through 3 4 5 and some of my patient 8 and 10 medications and the seizure and they've not got control so they come to us and yes they improve so it there have been randomized controlled trial of uh, the of the ketogenic diet people who are on the ketogenic diet and people who are only on the anti seizure medications that has been randomized and it has been shown uh so then what happened is that they took these patients they randomized them to either groups one was given the ketogenic diet one was not given the ketogenic diet they kept on the anti seizure medications after uh, a period of time all of them went on to the, the the ketogenic diet in the first few months when they were on an, either anti seizure medication or the ketogenic diet there was a definite difference between the two uh, and that has been shown uh, it has not been used in de novo so if you are asking that you take say 100 patients and begin them on the anti seizure medication then take another 100 and begin them on the ketogenic diet and then you compare these two groups that is not been done because uh, it's very difficult to have patients who have not tried anti seizure medications uh, on the ketogenic diet i have maybe five or six who came to me and said no we don't want to take medication we want to try the diet as a first line they they are doing well but we haven't been able to do it as a study anyone else anything else <clears throat> hello am i audible yes sir you are audible no no more question sir here Okay. One question is there. One more question. Okay, let me have a look. Which stage? Uh, which stage? I will read it out to me. Uh, will you read it out to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In which stage I will? Uh, I should consider the ketogenic diet. Doctor Sajal is asking. No, no, I didn't get it. Ketogenic diet versus. In which stage I uh, I should consider the ketogenic diet? In which uh, state stage? Okay, a anyone who has uh, yeah, uh, the glut one you know, deficiency syndrome, anyone who has the uh, by the way the androgenous mm, deficiency because they, they cannot use glucose. Anyone who has refractory epilepsy because this is non-invasive uh, and uh, if they fail within say a few months, then you can always think of surgery. or if they have gone through surgery i have a few of those patients where the where the surgery failed or the seizures recurred and then they come to me for the diet uh so these are all the patients that we usually try there are few who come because they don't want the side effects of the of the medication i hope that is answered yes sir anything else anyone else so how many uh, were the uh, participants hello yes ankit ji hello we are not able to see from here sir from back end they can see i mentioned ankit ji you 
43. Yes, 43. So total 43 doctors they are attending this session. Prashanji, you can start with the thank you note. Just I'm connecting this up. Hello, my voice is audible. Hello. Yes, oh, yes sir. Yes, sir. I, yeah, my, I think I lost my connection. That's the reason. Uh, thank you, sir. Thanks. Uh, at the outset, I will uh, I take this opportunity to, to thank you for sharing your expertise on this uh, uh, important topic and make this complex subject simpler and useful for young doctors. I will also thanks uh, um, to all that doctor who have joined virtually with us. Uh, I'm sure uh, this will help you and benefit it to you for your experience uh, for a faculty, from the faculty. Uh, all the participants will get digital certificate uh, for the completion of the master class signed by Dr. Jane Arthur through uh, Alkem Executive. Uh, healthcare for all com uh, commitment. Healthcare for all is our commitment at Alkem. We, uh, we solicit your continued prescription support for a key brand such as Brevashore, Donapium, Pentanor, and Neurochem D. Our brands are available at the most of the chemist shop, but in case any patient find any difficulty, I will uh, I will request you to uh, connect connect them back to us and to serve them promptly. Thank you, sir. Thanks for giving uh, giving your valuable time. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> 